Hello and welcome to Wellness Live. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses and this broadcast is brought to you today by Loma Linda University Health's Living Whole Wellness Program. Well, if you are watching us live, it is December. And when we look back on the year and the year before, we've had quite a two year period um, with COVID-19 changing a lot of what we do. And so what I wanted to do today is actually take a look back over the last 20 months of what is COVID? What do we know? What do we know moving forward? Well, I am so excited to introduce you to Dr. Adrian Cotton. He is our chief medical operations uh, here at Loma Linda and one of our experts when it comes to COVID-19. He has been uh, a lot of times over the past 20 months, our representative in outside of Loma Linda through multiple media outlets. And we are just so thrilled to have him here today for Wellness Live. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Cotton and let's get started with our discussion on COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Moses, and thank you to Loma Linda University Health for allowing me to um, be here today. Um, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about COVID. Uh, hopefully we'll get some of those answered um, and we'll just kind of give you a rundown as what sort of what we've gone through through the last 20 months. Hopefully you're seeing a little cute fuzzy ball on the screen, which I think most of us have come to now associate with COVID-19. Uh, this is electron microscopy uh, picture of a COVID-19 vaccine. It's actually not technically COVID-19. It's actually SARS coronavirus number two. Um, that's its official name. We have called it COVID-19 because it was discovered the end of 2019 um, over in China. And that's how it's gotten the pet name that it's there. So I don't think any of us believe that this was going to consume so much of the last 20 months of our lives. Uh, not only here at Loma Linda University Health, but across the county, the state, and around the world. This little guy has, um, has really consumed um, the world. This is what the world looked like before COVID-19. Uh, and amazingly enough, it still pretty much looks like that now. And this is what LLU Health looked like before COVID-19. Um, a nice, calm, surreal, gentle place where we kind of knew what we were doing and we weren't taking care of hundreds of extra patients that we had come up with many, many different plans to take, to, to take care of if we got them. A little brief COVID-19 timeline. Now, I could probably spend three or four hours going through a timeline of this. I'm just trying to hit some of the high points. Back in December of 2019, uh, numerous cases of pneumonia of an unknown cause were found in Wuhan, China. In January 2020, the CDC announced some information about a novel coronavirus, and the first lab confirmed cases were up in Washington State. In January, Loma Linda University Health, the Department of Epidemiology, and some of the administration started a weekly call about this virus to to kind of keep a track on it, keep our eyes on it to see what was going to happen with it. Eventually that call turned into a twice a day command center with 200 plus people on it. Again, trying to manage uh, things that we were predicting that were coming, things that were happening um, and all things healthcare related at the hospital. In March of 2020, World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. The federal government uh, declared this a national, nationwide emergency. And then the state of California, uh, probably ahead of a bunch of the other states, started to kind of really shut things down uh, and kind of lock things down. In April of 2020 was the first time we uh, recommended uh, wearing masks. And a lot of you know that we recommended them. Then we said, don't wear them. Then we said, wear them. And then don't wear them. And that's kind of gone back and forth. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. In December of 2020 was the first COVID-19 vaccine that was given outside a clinical trial um, to a nurse. And in December of 2020 was the first COVID-19 vaccines given here at Loma Linda University Health as well. In January of 2021, worldwide cases surpassed 100 million. In March of 2021, the US surpassed 100 million vaccines given. In July of 2021, the Delta variant became the most dominant strain. And we've heard about that for the last three or four months. Now we're hearing about Omicron and there'll be other variants that we will hear about 
over time. If you look at recent pandemics in world history, um, the Hong Kong flu was in 1968 um, that lasted a year or so, maybe two. Influenza, different type of flu in 1957. We've all this has been referenced back multiple times during COVID about the Spanish flu back in 1918, lasted one to two years. And then there's the bubonic plague, which started in 1855 and amazingly enough, went for 105 years, officially ending in 1960. And we certainly hope COVID-19 does not last as long as the bubonic plague. So how is COVID-19 different from the recent pandemics that we've had? So it is the first global pandemic that's really occurred with our ability to travel around the world so easily. Um, getting on a plane and going somewhere is much easier now than it was in the 60s and 50s. It's also the first pandemic that's had a worldwide media presence um, and so much information sharing and information technology. We've never had this before. It's the first pandemic in the global area of the internet uh, where things, information can be shared, both good information and bad information. We've all seen things that are true. We've all seen things that are false, both probably on media and on the internet. Part of that is because at the beginning, we knew so little about it. And still, we don't know everything about it. And that's why I think we, we, changed, we seem to change our mind on what we're doing. It's because we're learning more information all the time. The other thing I'm talking with Dr. Herman in our lab that he pointed out to me, this is the first pandemic that the genetic sequencing of the virus was done so quickly, within about a week of being identified. And with that, and that information being able to spread to so many other people, that's how we were able to come up with some treatments to try, some vaccines to try on such a rapid uh, fashion. At the beginning, since we didn't have any treatments, um, everything was about prevention strategies. So you've all heard about social distancing, um, which was, depending where you lived, was three feet away from people, was six feet away from people, was 12, 12 feet away from people. And the idea behind social distancing is that a virus can only spread so far. And if you don't come in contact with somebody that's had a virus and you, you stay away, that you won't be able to catch the virus. If you think about it though, from a social distancing perspective, social distancing theoretically would only work if we all stayed perfectly still in the first two weeks of this, 10 to 15 feet apart from everybody else, and then the virus couldn't go anywhere. But we don't stay still. So if I'm walking behind Dr. Moses and I'm six feet behind her, technically I'm social distancing, but I'm in, as we continue to walk, I'm still in her space. So again, social distancing may have helped, may not, but it was one of the things we thought we should try. Then there's mask wearing. And as again, you saw in the media and with Dr. Fauci is we should wear masks. We shouldn't wear masks. We should wear masks. And I think the data is still not completely clear on the, the absolute benefits of it. But again, if you're coughing and sneezing into a mask versus into open air, you're spreading less viral particles. Um, and that's why mask wearing in certain scenarios and certain situations certainly makes sense. And then everyone is aware of all the events that were canceled. Basically everything shut down. Um, and they didn't want you going outside. They didn't want you going to the grocery store. They didn't want you meeting with people. So all sorts of events have been canceled. They've been coming back a little bit here and there in different areas of the country. Um, but again, even as we have surges of the different variants, Delta, Omicron, et cetera, you hear about things being canceled again. And again, the idea behind that is to try to get less people in a, in a enclosed space or a tight space where we know all viruses, especially respiratory viruses, can spread more rapidly if the people are close together. A quick look at some of the numbers um, here at Loma Linda, because I think people are interested in that. Uh, first, I'll show you some numbers from the medical center and then from the children's hospital. So these numbers are accurate through the end of November um, of 2021. So the total number of patients that came into the hospital and then were discharged. So these not patients seen in the emergency room, but patients actually admitted to the hospital. Again, this is going back to March of 2020 through November 30, was 3,422. Um, on top of that, there were 502 people that passed away in our facility of either of or with COVID uh, during that time frame as well. That's not an insignificant number of uh, individuals. 
our medical ICU team uh, has done a wonderful tribute that many of you, if you're on campus, have seen when you come over from the parking structure between some of the trees. There's some ribbons with a bunch of different hearts on them representing all the different individuals that have passed away. It's a very touching um, thing to see. And again, it's one of the ways our staff has shown appreciation uh, to the patients and the families that they've taken care of. If you look at our average daily census of COVID again, since this started, so March of 2020 through, or sorry, April of 2020 through uh, November, you know, initially right at the beginning, we shut down everything. The state asked us to shut things down. They asked us to cancel surgeries. Uh, they asked us to prepare to be able to take care of um, 150 to 200% more patients than, than we normally do. We put all those plans in and then no patients came and people were bored and we were sending employees home because there was no work for them to do. Um, so then we started again, bringing things back, restarting things. And there was this a little bit more of a surge in July of last year where we went up, we averaged just a little under 40 patients a day. And then again, things improved. And then back in December and January is where everything kind of uh, fell off the rails. And in January, our average daily census was over 115 patients with COVID. Um, we peaked at over 200 patients uh, in our hospital. Then it kind of went down and actually in April and May, we had a few days where we had zero uh, COVID patients in the hospital. And then in July, it started to go up. And then since July, it's kind of gone up and down and up and down a little bit uh, in that time frame. Now, if you look at the children's hospital, so the total number of patients that have been an inpatient and discharge was 1,060. Um, and five of those, uh, again, five on top of that 1,060 uh, passed away. Again, some of them with COVID and some of them um, of, of COVID. Now, interestingly enough, you'll, that number 1,060 seems quite high. What you have to remember at our children's hospital is this is where our pregnant moms are. So a lot of those numbers are uh, patients on the OBGYN service uh, that are here to deliver. There was not 1,060 children that were admitted over this time frame. However, of those five deaths, all of those were uh, children. And we did have a couple of moms pass away. However, they were transferred to the main adult campus and those numbers would fall under the medical center. Uh, again, this was the average daily census in the children's hospital, which again peaked in December, January of a little bit over 25. So kind of significantly less. But if you look at the pattern, the pattern is the same as the adult hospital. And then if you kind of take a gander at this graph and keep that in your mind, when you look at the cases in San Bernardino County, this is the curve that occurred as well. So this is the number of cases of people that tested positive. If you look at the hospitalization curve, it basically matches this delayed by about a week or two, but the curve matches the same as this. So with all this, how did LLUH respond? Well, we had a command center. Um, which I think was vitally important for us to be able to take care of the patients and all the situations that we needed to. In that command center, there was representatives from uh, every different area that could possibly um, touch the patient or um, be responsible for doing something that helps take care of patients uh, at this organization. And with everybody being able to meet in the same space and on Zoom on a daily basis, we were able to make decisions um, very rapidly with the support of the administrative team uh, that basically said, do whatever you need to do to take care of patients. I'm proud of the fact that we were always able to take care of the COVID-19 patients that came here. Our staff went above and beyond um, in taking care of those patients. We were also very fortunate with our supply chain management group, and they were way ahead of the game over the other hospitals on ordering supplies and making sure we have supplies that we needed to keep our staff as safe as possible. In talking to some of the other hospitals in the area, they were unable to get certain things of which our supply chain people, again, very early on, were taking, um, uh, making orders and, and looking at all the different options and getting things. So I feel like we were actually always able to safely take care of the COVID-19 patients as well. Um, but the people, it's the people that count in, in doing this. The nurses, the providers, the respiratory therapists, the EV staff, the cafeteria, the lab, the IT staff, and I'm sure I've left people out. It's the people, however, 
that made the biggest difference. The other thing that I noticed as well um, is it's the team. Uh, Loma Linda really was a team and Loma Linda cares. Uh, they care about the patients. They care about the staff that work here. Um, and I think what's remarkable is when this all started back in, again, March or April, you know, we were kind of under the assumption this was going to be a two week, three week thing. It was kind of said, well, let's just do this till Easter and life can get back to normal. Well, that that didn't happen. Um, and again, as you're all aware, we're still going through things with COVID-19. Plus, on top of that, we still have all the other patients that we're needing to take care of and taken care of. And I believe the staff at Loma Linda went above and beyond what they um, what was initially expected or initially planned. And they've continued to do this. And I think that is why we've had such uh, a good outcome for our patients here at Loma Linda. That's my first section, Dr. Moses. Well, thank you, Dr. Cotton. Um, we are now going to have some questions that we have been uh, that have been coming in. Now, if you're watching us live, go ahead and type your questions in the comments section and we will be able to ask Dr. Cotton in person. So some of the things that have come through, here's one question. If I have already had COVID-19, can I still get the new strains? So yes, the simple answer is yes. Um, just like with influenza that has different strains, um, you could certainly get different strains of COVID. The thought, however, is you probably won't have as bad a case of COVID as, uh, with one of the new strains if you've had COVID before, because your body will recognize the virus and has some, again, innate ability to fight off that virus. But yes, you can certainly get um, any of the different strains. You could even get a strain that you've already had, but it's highly unlikely you will be as sick um, if you get one of, if, if you get quotes COVID again. Now, Dr. Cotton, you've talked a little bit about mask on, mask off, you know, it, it, th there were messages coming back and forth, you know, at the beginning and throughout. Where is our stance now in science when it comes to masking? So again, I think if you, if you look at the last 20 months, um, a lot of people will say science has gone out the window um, because again, we have been as, as, a, as a healthcare, um, global healthcare uh, group of people have been very wishy-washy on what the right answer is. And we've told you over and over, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, and gone back and forth. What you have to think about with a mask is if you're coughing, if you're, again, it will certainly catch and decrease the amount of viral spread that you have. It will not make it zero. There is no way to make it zero, but it can certainly decrease the amount of virus that you can spread around. So if you're someone that's at risk of catching something or, or you're um, overly concerned about COVID or you're a high risk individual that if you get COVID and you'll have complications, there's probably some advantages to wearing a mask. Um, we saw zero cases of influenza at Loma Linda University Health last year. I never would have predicted that. Um, and again, probably because of potentially mask wearing, canceling events, social distancing, hand washing, a lot of those things. Again, viruses aren't likely to spread as much uh, in that kind of an environment. Now, we talked a little bit about the messaging. And so that actually gets into a conversation about media. So how did the media play a role? Where do we get our information? Who can we trust? What should we do moving forward when it comes to the media? So what we have to remember about the media is they have to sell a story. Um, COVID-19 is a spectacular story to sell. And again, I think also though the media, just like healthcare, they didn't know which way things were going. So they were selling stories that they had heard, which may have been accurate on Wednesday, but may have been very inaccurate on Thursday. Um, again, with the media, with the internet, there's more information that was able to be spread on quotes in this pandemic than any other pandemic that we've had. And I think it's a lesson to all of us in, again, trying to be as accurate about information as we can. Um, there's probably a middle of the road that is where most of the information should come from rather than way on the left side or way on the right side. And when I say left and right, I'm not talking political parties, but this is a very politicized disease not only in the United States, but around the world. But the truth is probably somewhere in the middle of all of this. Um, but again, media and internet 
they're they're there to sell stories and either the better things look or the worse things look it's a better story so in in, in that sense where do you suggest people go for good information? So that's, again, also very difficult. Um, the CDC puts very uh, reliable information on their websites. I think people talking to their actual providers and where someone that they know and have a personal relationship with and can have a, a open conversation with, that's probably the best place to get something going to academic medical centers, websites, Loma Linda University Health, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, places like that, also are gonna put very reliable information out there. Okay, great. Well, let's do one more question before we go to the second half of your presentation. Um, why don't we ask this one? What is considered fully vaccinated? So that definition also has changed um, in the last few, few weeks as well. So prior to about two months ago, fully vaccinated was um, one dose of J&J, &J, sorry, two weeks after one dose of J&J, &J, or two weeks after the two dose regimen of either Moderna or Pfizer. Fully vaccinated today is considered two weeks after the booster dose. So either a third shot in the Moderna Pfizer world or a second shot in the J&J &J world but it's two weeks after you've had that shot. So that's now what is considered fully vaccinated. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for answering these questions. Let's get back to the second half. All right, here we go. Okay, so now what does the world look like now? Well, it looks pretty much the same. Um, Obviously there's been a change in the world population. There's been a change in the trust in uh, science. There's been a change in how people interact with the media. And probably the most disappointing thing in what the world looks like different now is there's, there's been a change in how people interact with each other. The, the trust level with different individuals has certainly changed now than it, has, uh, than it was 20 months ago. Interesting enough, what does Loma University Health look like now? This is our new hospital, we have moved. So we actually look different and the ability to move through this uh, pandemic is absolutely amazing. So currently at Loma University Health, we have about 40 COVID-19 patients in the hospital. About half of them are ICU level and about half of them are acute care. A quarter of those patients are on ventilators and a quarter of those patients are vaccinated. Um, and we'll talk about the vaccine uh, in, a, in a minute as well. What we still know is prevention is probably much better than any current treatment that we have. So staying as healthy as possible, eating as well as you can, exercising on a regular basis, getting some time in the sunshine, making sure you get enough sleep. And this has been very hard for healthcare workers because again, healthcare workers have been working again, much more and over time. And so getting sleep definitely is detrimental. Um, supporting your mental and emotional health. And again, one of the huge things we saw with COVID was the decreased interaction with other people. Um, a lot of people didn't interact with anybody. Um, a lot of, some people, everything was via Zoom. Uh, but the, the interaction with people has made, the decreased interaction with people has made a huge toll um, on people. And then again, there's certain scenarios where social distancing and mask wearing um, definitely will decrease um, your risk of catching something. And that's why those are still recommended under the prevention side of things. When you look at treatments, you know, treatments are still mainly supportive care. Um, we do have some intravenous antiviral therapy like remdesivir. Um, those are helpful, but have to be given early. Uh, if you come in if you have symptoms that started uh, today and you come in two weeks from now, uh, antiviral therapy probably doesn't help you that much because the virus is not in your system at that point. So antiviral therapy helps early on. The monoclonal antibody therapy that you've heard about, Regeneron, Regencov, and other things like that. What they do is they try to increase the antibodies in your system so that your, that your immune system has something to recognize when it tries to help fend off the virus. Again, also helpful if given early. And then coming soon, there's hopefully some oral antiviral, oral antiviral therapy available, which again, can be helpful if given early. 
So the key for this is if you think you have something, it's getting help early. So call your primary care doctor, interact with them and find out where you can get, potentially get some of the treatments or some of these therapies, but early is better off. But mainly what we do is supportive care is we're waiting for our body's immune systems to fend off the virus. And oftentimes by the time patients get to the hospital, the virus is actually already disappearing. And then what we're dealing with and uh, what we have to handle is the inflammatory response to the virus. And that's where the supportive care comes in. In regards to vaccinations, the current vaccinations that we have available here in the US, they're all mRNA based, um, and, which is a completely new technology that we've not used in vaccines before. Even though mRNA based vaccines have, there's been research done on them before, this is the first time that we've used them um, for any illness. What you have to remember about vaccinations, they de the, what the idea is, is they decrease the severity of the illness that you get. We hope it keeps you out of the hospital. We hope it keeps you out of the ICU. We hope it keeps you from death. But what you have to remember, vaccinations does not prevent you from catching COVID-19. You can still catch it just like you can catch um, influenza after you've had the influenza vaccine. What we do know based on these vaccinations currently, there's been eight and a half billion doses given worldwide. There's been 485 million doses given in the United States. And currently, uh, as Dr. Moses pointed out earlier, boosters are recommended for those that have received the primary series of, uh, of vaccinations. It is recommended that you get a booster uh, for added protection. Briefly about COVID-19 as well. Um, coronaviruses, of which COVID-19 is one, they've been around for years. There's been probably at least four, if not more coronaviruses that probably started out as pandemics probably not global or worldwide pandemics, that are now considered probably nothing more routine than the common cold. We've tested on our respiratory panel here at Loma Linda, again, at least four different coronaviruses for years and years. Um, and people that test positive for that, it's symptoms like the common cold, not more than that. You hear about mutations. Mutations are actually a really good thing because generally as viruses mutate, they become more infectious, which sounds bad, but they become less lethal. And so the more we hear about mutations, it actually isn't a bad thing. And what, what's happening is the virus wants to survive and its ability to survive, it will mutate. But again, as it mutates, it generally becomes safer overall for the population. Now you've all heard about Omicron. Um, so this is the most recent variant. And again, it does appear to spread more easily than prior variants, which means again, it's more infectious. But right now, it doesn't appear to cause a severe illness, but it's probably too soon to tell us that. It hasn't been around long enough for us to really know. So usually it's gonna take two to four weeks at a minimum before you kind of get a feel for how many people are gonna get hospitalized, et cetera, from that. And it probably takes six to 12 weeks to kind of really understand what's happening. It hasn't been around long enough for us to know that. But the preliminary data is actually pretty good about it. Um, and you've probably heard some of the news reports that, uh, again, across the United States, the United Kingdom and other places, the majority of people that are testing positive for Omicron are people that are already vaccinated. And a large percent of those are, quote, fully vaccinated with their booster doses. But again, I'd like to remind you, the vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID. What we hope the vaccine does is decreases your risk of having serious illness from it. And the current thought is the vaccines that are currently out there should decrease this, should continue to decrease the severity of the disease, uh, even in Omicron. So what do we do now? So we need to continue to take care of our own individual health. We're all personally responsible for that. Uh, we, can't, we can't make our neighbors exercise. We can't make our neighbors eat right, but we can take care of our own individual health and we need to do that. We also need to continue to take care of the patients that we are blessed uh, to have received here. And again, our staff and our team does that better than anybody else. I am so incredibly proud of all of them. And then in the background, science will continue to develop therapeutic interventions to decrease the risk of complications and death. And again, science is now starting to roll in a little bit more than science has been over the last 20 months. At the very beginning of COVID, we did a, um, Dr. Hart hosted a meeting about COVID with the San Bernardino County Health Department and the Riverside County Health Department. 
And one of the statements that was made then is, what do we know about coronavirus 19? And the answer is, we know everything about it and we know nothing about it. It's a virus, it's an infectious disease. And realistically, the answer is still the same to that. We know everything about coronavirus, it's an infectious respiratory virus, and we know nothing about it because there's so much still to learn about it. Thank you, Dr. Moses. That's the formal part of the presentation. I'm happy to answer any more questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. We do have some questions coming in. Here's one question. How do I decide which vaccine to get as my booster? That's also a wonderful question, and people will have heard that um, it's better to mix and match. Again, that's probably not known. There's been no randomized controlled trials, which tells us one or the other. If you did receive j and it is thought that either getting the Pfizer or the Moderna is a better option for your booster. If you got the Moderna and the Pfizer, probably, again, because you know what your reaction was to the first two, probably safer and you probably have a little bit more of a well-known reaction to the third dose. Um, there's been some articles written about switching those up. Um, but again, for most people, I tell them if they've received the primary series with Pfizer, you're probably better off getting the Pfizer dose because at least you know how you reacted to the first two doses of it. Well, we've been talking about vaccines, but can we go back to how we get this for a second? Because I think that uh, there are some concerns and basically a lot of fears on how much exposure do I need? So what does exposure mean and when should I start getting concerned? So again, the exposure definition has kind of changed a little bit over the last 20 months, but still it's basically, it's 15 minutes um, within six feet of somebody that's COVID positive, um, sorry, 15 consecutive minutes uh, within six feet of somebody that's COVID positive with people not wearing personal protective equipment. So if I'm wearing, again, if I'm taking care of a patient and I'm in that room and I have my N95 mask on, my face shield on, et cetera, that's not considered an exposure. If I walked in there like this, that would be considered an exposure. So we had a question come in, does LLUH offer the booster shot on campus? So probably not officially on campus if you're looking at our actual physical site, but we do offer it at our Park Avenue uh, clinics. Um, and also some of the primary care clinics offer the booster shot as well. And I just wanna say, if any of you are thinking about getting your booster, we do encourage you to do so. I got mine at the Park Avenue uh, location. So it's a wonderful, wonderful um, thing to do and you get through pretty fast. Okay, so another thing that we wanted to kind of cover today uh, when it comes to COVID before we let you go, Dr. Cotton, is um, talking a little bit about the distrust and what we should be doing. So there's distrust on the, the masking, there is distrust on the medications, there is distrust on how long you should quarantine and what what is the definition of quarantine. Can we just talk a little bit about the distrust now um, that is out, kind of the messaging that is out there right now? And so I think healthcare was, you know, prior to this pandemic, considered one of the most trustful groups of individuals that you could have. Um, that your nurses, your doctors are always going to tell you the right thing and the, the most appropriate thing. That trust level has decreased significantly. And again, I think it is because we have changed our minds so frequently through this. And I believe the reason why quotes our minds were changed, you know, why different statements were made is people wanted to feel like they were doing something. They wanted to feel like they were helping. So let's try this. Okay, well, that may didn't work. Let's try this. Well, that didn't work. Let's try this. And again, even at our hospital, when we were having these, some of these command center calls, we would change our mind multiple times a day on what we thought we should do with testing this person or isolating that person. Um, and it gets very, very confusing for people. Um, and I think, again, we know a little bit more information now than we did 20 months ago about all that. Um, I think the time to wear a mask is if you're around a bunch of people that potentially are sick, or if you are very concerned about it yourself and want to decrease your exposure, that's a good time to wear a mask. Is there, if people ask me about wearing masks outside, I can't really come up with any great reason why you should wear masks outside. Um, unless again, you're in a very, very small area with lots and lots of people. Um, so, and, and again, there's been so much 
um, again, also politicizing of this, where, where again, you take whichever political party you want. One party says X and one party says Y. Well, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. It's not on those on those extremes. And with with the apparent waffling of healthcare providers, I think that's where the distrust comes in. I think the trust will be rebuilt. The trust will come back. Um, but again, that's going to take a lot of conversations. And again, this is where you're best to have a really good relationship with the primary care doctor, where you can have these discussions because they will give you more information than you're able to get from the news and the media. Um, et cetera. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a great conversation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today for Wellness Live and for joining us all year. If you're watching us live, it's December. We're preparing for the holidays. I want to wish each of you a happy holiday season from the Wellness Live family to yours. And we will be back again in January, January 27th. And some of you may be thinking about New Year's resolutions and starting to eat better. So we're going to be talking talking about stress and how we eat. So hopefully we'll see you then. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses and we hope to see you next time.